Good afternoon. You can talk back to me. Good afternoon. <laughs> Hi, I'm Pastor Joanna Mitchell. Um, I'm senior pastor here at Grace Lutheran. I am delighted to welcome you all here today as um, we have Henry Emmons speaking with us. Just a lo couple logistics before I introduce him. Um, down the hall, this way, if you walk out these doors into the right, um, are our bathrooms, so if you can, you can find those. And there's also a drinking fountain down there as well with a, it's a, a touch list. There's little um, water cups that are attached if you need anything along those lines. Um, we welcome you to go and make yourself as comfortable as you need to. Um, you don't have to wear a mask in this space, but like we, you can if you want to. So like it's not a mandatory thing, but just what is your comfort level and what feels good for your own safety and security. Um, I want to say a special welcome to those of you who are joining us online. Um, we are glad you are here. Um, and this will be archived on our YouTube page and on our website. Thank you as well and welcome to our partners who have helped us put together this event. Nativity Lutheran Church in St. Anthony, Lord of Life in Ramsey, and Trinity Episcopal in Anoka. We are super grateful and so glad for your partnership and your um, willingness to help us bring Henry Emmons up here today to talk with us. I'm going to begin us in prayer. Loving God, we give you thanks for this day. For the beauty of fall and the changing of seasons and the reminder that in transitions that um, you are a God who leads us through change, who helps us when things are hard and dying and also promise us new life and new birth. We give you thanks for this opportunity to learn about resilience together and we ask, oh God, for your guidance, your comfort, your leadership and your presence to be among us today to foster our conversation and guide us in faith and hope in the world. We lift up these prayers, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Amen. I believe after um, your main presentation, we're going to have a time of questions. Um, we do have a microphone because there are people online. We do need you to speak your questions into the microphone so people can hear you. Um, and so we'll come around. If you raise your hand, someone will bring that to you and allow you to ask your question that way, or Dr. Emmons will repeat it for us. Um, and without further ado, um, I'm really excited to welcome Henry Emmons, MD, who is a holistic psychiatrist and the author of The Chemistry of Joy and The Chemistry of Calm. He is also co-founder of the websites naturalmentalhealth.com and joylab.coach. Um, dedicated to restoring resilience and rediscovery, rediscovering joy. Henry lives in Northfield with his wife Jane and their joyful puppy. Um, how do I say this? Bodhi. Nice. They're eagerly awaiting their first grandchild in February. Congratulations. Please join me in giving a nice warm welcome to Dr. Henry Emmons. Well, thank you. Um, you're able to hear me okay in the back there? Great. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for coming. It's wonderful to see some people I know, even up here in northern Minnesota. Um, it's a beautiful day for a drive, and so I'm really, really pleased that you're here. So I am going to um, spend our time today trying to talk with you about how I understand resilience and the things that go into that from a really broad perspective. So I consider myself a holistic or integrative psychiatrist, and what that really means to me is that one tries to weave together anything that helps us to sustain a better mood, uh, greater resilience in the face of stress, and maybe even touch upon joy once in a while. So I am going to start by sharing a picture from a movie that some of you remember, I'm sure, uh, City Slickers with Billy Crystal and Jack Palance who are here in this photo. So if you remember that movie, Billy Crystal played this slightly neurotic, early middle-aged guy who was having an early middle-aged crisis. And his friends and brother-in-law convinced him to go to this dude ranch where he met Curly, the crusty old cowboy. 
Curly kept referring to this one thing. There's one thing you could do. He kind of implied that if you just did it and you knew that one thing, you would somehow find, you know, your life would work out just fine. But he would never reveal to them what it is. So here near the end of the movie, Billy Crystal has him alone. He's just badgering him as he does ever so well. And he's broken him down so Curly is about to reveal the secret, the one thing you can do. But then he has a heart attack and dies, so he doesn't find out about it. So I am telling you that if I am still standing at the end of this talk, I am going to reveal to you <laughs> the one thing that you can do. I want to um, start then with a story that maybe some of you have heard before. It's a story that I heard as told from the Native American tradition. So, as the story goes, there was a wise old sage, a, a, a grandfather, an elder in, in his community, who had a grandchild about four or five years old, a little boy. And the boy just adored his grandfather, and he watched his every move. So when he was staying with him for an extended time, he saw his grandfather had this pattern to his days. He had a rhythm. Every morning at around sunrise, the grandfather would go to his living room, sit down in front of a little altar that he had set up, and he'd take this necklace off and place it on the altar. And then he just closed his eyes for a while and sat quietly. Then he would pick up the necklace, put it back on, and go about his day. Every evening at around sunset, he did the very same thing. After a few days, the little boy was so curious, he, he just couldn't help himself. So he asked his grandfather, Grandfather, what are you doing when you sit down in your living room with your eyes closed, and what is the necklace you keep taking off? So his grandfather took the necklace off, held it out in his hand, and on the end of the necklace is a silver medallion that has engraved on it two wolf heads. The grandfather says, this is to remind me that inside of me, just like all of us, there are these two wolves. And one of them is really kind of kind and generous and cares mostly about the tribe. But the other one is selfish and um, mostly thinks about himself. And the two of them, he said, are fighting a great battle. So the little boy's eyes are big because he's kind of seeing this very literally. And so he says, Grandfather, which one will win? And the grandfather says, it is the one we feed the most. It's the one we feed the most. And so every morning at sunrise and every evening at sunset, I am just taking some time to feed the good wolf. And I'd like that to be somewhat of a backdrop for the rest of this talk because there are so many things that feed the bad wolf that happen without our trying, but they're just there. And we do need to intentionally pay attention to that good wolf from time to time. And I want to talk about a number of ways that we can do that from a whole host of different things. <clears throat> There's a, a really nice quote from the author of Gone with the Wind, Margaret Mitchell, who wrote, every problem has two handles. You can grab it by the handle of fear or the handle of hope. And so, again, what I'm wanting to do here is to try to grab this problem, this very human problem, from the handle of hope. But I also believe that we first have to at least name the problem. And there are lots of ways that this, that this kind of problem takes shape. It's not only depression, but I want to give you a little bit of a context because this is such a prevalent thing in our day and age. So one way of thinking about this is to look at a study 
that epidemiologists started uh, over 100 years ago in 1910. What they did was brilliant, and they've been doing it now for 110 years. Every time the US census happens, there is a small percentage of Americans who were given questions to ask about the state of their mental well-being. So these are questions very much like what you know, a, a therapist or doctor might ask you about, about depression. And so what they have seen over these now 110 years is that about every measurement, there's been another 10% increase in rates of depression or anxiety in this country. Now that's a really big change in an historically short period of time. 110 years is not very long in the scheme of things because we, we tend to think of these conditions largely as genetic, which they are to some extent, but our genes don't change in such a short time period. So there's something else going on and we're gonna try to address some of that. So that's one perspective. Another way of thinking about this, there's a psychologist named Martin Seligman who's very well known for helping found a field of psychology known as positive psychology. And he frames it this way, he says, if you're born after World War II, which of course is most of us now in this country, your chances of becoming depressed are about 10 times greater than if you'd simply been born around 1900. So again, in a very short historical period, there's a big change in our susceptibility to things like depression or anxiety. Now, um, I wanna share one last thing about this that most people are not aware of, and that is that depression ranks as the number one most common cause of disability in this country. So people who are unable to work for any health reason at all, depression is the most likely reason for that. And that has been true in our country for quite a while, but it has not been true in much of the rest of the world. So the developing world, for example, they've historically had far lower rates of these conditions than we do. Lots of possible reasons for that, but no one knows for sure. However, what we do know is that now, in the last probably 10 or 15, maybe 20 years, depression is growing everywhere in the world, not just the US. So the World Health Organization is really concerned that this is kind of the new pandemic or epidemic, and that they estimate within five to 10 years, depression will be the number one cause of disability worldwide. So again, the, the, the problem is real. You know, we do need to acknowledge it, we need to see it, we need to try to understand some of the causes behind it, mostly so that we can take measures to try to change it. So I really see this problem largely as an erosion of resilience. And so I'm gonna say what I mean by resilience in a little bit, but I just think that, you know, again, our genetics haven't changed in this short of a time period. Our world has changed, but, but so has our our way of interacting with the world, if you will. Um, but I think it is a breakdown in resilience, which has lots of factors to it. However, the way that we as a, as a nation, and especially we in healthcare, are responding to this is largely through prescribing medication. So I think you probably know that. And the slide up here is is showing um, just a, a one perspective on how effectively that strategy is working. The bottom line is it's not working very well, but let me, let me kind of talk you through this. This is a slide that I, I drew from the website at the, you see at the bottom, Minnesota Health Scores. And it is, um, it's, an, it's an attempt to, to try to follow a few very significant public health problems like depression, but also things like diabetes and I think hypertension, to see how well we are treating them, how, how effectively our system is, is dealing with it. And what this slide shows is 
that there's all these clinics, 115 medical clinics within the state of Minnesota participating in this study. And what they do, you probably, if you've been to a family doctor recently, there's a good chance you have filled out this questionnaire. It's, a, it's called a PHQ-9, and maybe the doctor has asked you, it's nine questions. I went in for a shoulder problem, and they asked me the nine questions. But it's, um, it's to try to, to make sure that we're not missing people with depression and their offered treatment. So this is looking at how effective are we at treating it. Now remember, the main treatment offered, at least in this context, is medication. And what we see is that based on these, this questionnaire and, and how they define illness and, and recovery, what we're seeing is that only, only about you know, maybe between 10 and 15 percent of the clinics in the state are getting people into remission through this treatment. Very low percentage. The very best clinic is up around 30 percent. When I studied, um, you know, the, the historical uh, treatments for depression when I was in my training, we learned that if you didn't do anything at all, you just let it run its course, within six months to a year, 40 or 50 percent of people will have recovered from depression. That's kind of the, the, the measure against which all treatments are compared. So um, 40 to 50 percent by doing nothing, 8 to maybe 20 or 25 percent by doing this intervention. So it's clearly not working. I don't actually think it's quite as bad as it appears here. I don't, I, I think there's something a little bit off with the questionnaire or the definitions here, but the, suffice it to say, it is not good. It is not an effective strategy. Um, so I think that we can do better with this, and it, the reason that we maybe aren't doing as well as we can is because we aren't really recognizing the complexity of this. You know, these conditions affect the whole person. They don't affect just your serotonin system or just dopamine or what have you. Um, it's affecting all aspects of who we are as human beings. And so I think that we need something that is a little more complex and has more nuance to it in order to respond to it. I also encounter so many people that want to know what they can do for themselves, that don't want to take a medication forever or even be in therapy, you know, forever, um, but want to have some other options that give them, you know, something they can kind of learn and grow and take with them so that this doesn't keep happening. So I want to um, share with you then a study that I was part of, I, after my original book came out, Chemistry of Joy, which is maybe 15 years ago now, I was invited to start a program at the Penny George Institute, which is part of Alina, part of a the Abbott Hospital. And um, what we did is we started something that I called resilience training, which is essentially these three major themes combined. We, we focused on nutrition, that was tailored to the individual. So we didn't just say everybody eat this same way. We tried to tailor it because people need different approaches to diet. Same thing with fitness or movement. We actually did, evaluated each person and gave them their own recommendations rather than just a blanket statement that this is what you should do. And then the third thing is we incorporated these groups where we train people to use mindfulness skills, in order to grow their ability to deal with stresses in their lives. So um, I'm just going to share with you one aspect of this research. What we did is we had groups that went through this program for eight weeks, and at the end of that time, and again six months and a year later, we measured a, a lot of different things, including that same questionnaire I referred to, the PHQ-9, the one I was talking about earlier. And so um, we had up to 20 people per group, and we had, for the study, we had two groups that we could compare to each other. And one group waited 
for about six months before they went through the treatment and then as they waited, they were considered the control group. So if that makes sense to you. Um, and this is the, the one uh, finding that I want to share with you. All the other findings, by the way, look very similar to this. They were all considered significant, meaning that there was enough improvement that it's believed to have been related to the intervention. And so what this shows here is just that questionnaire, the, the score on the PHQ-9. And beforehand, the scores were quite high. They were clearly in that range we considered depressed. And at the end, the scores were considered to be in remission. Um, 50, no, 60 percent of people reached complete remission. Remember, that's compared to about 10 to 20 percent. And, and everybody improved. And even if they didn't quite reach remission, everybody got better. So I want to talk about why, why might something like this work when other things don't work quite as well. And I want to now share with you my way of thinking about resilience. And I'll, I'll talk about this little picture here, which is a metaphor I use to think about resilience. So to me, I believe that resilience is absolutely natural, built in, part of who every one of us is at birth, and it's something we carry through with us our entire lives, but to different degrees. So this water cooler image is, is just a, an image I use to think about how one person is different from another on this continuum of resilience. So if you imagine a little tank, a little container in your body, maybe in your brain, that has in it an elixir that is what you, what you use to deal with life's stresses and difficulties. And everybody has this, but some people are blessed with a very big container, a big capacity for dealing with all of these things. And other people have a very small one. There's two things that determine that, I think, the size of the container. One is your genetics, which you cannot change. The second is the environment in which you grew up. You can't change that either once you're, <laughs> once you're our age. But you can change your relationship with that, the way that you perceive or think about it or remember it. But still, you know, the, the environment that you grew up in sets a tone that is with us most of our lives, really. A little bit hard to change. So that's important, but it's not the end of the story. The really important thing, in my view, it's not how large this container is, it is how much of this magical elixir is in it. So no matter the size, no matter your capacity, as long as you are doing the things that keep you somewhat filled up, you're not going to develop symptoms of depression or anxiety. And on the other side, you know, if you have a large container, but over a three-year period, you've lost your job, you've gotten divorced, your, your kid is in trouble using drugs or something, and maybe your parents are aging, and, you know, we've all been there. It happens to all of us at some point in our lives where all of these things kind of stream together in a relatively short period of time, and it's depleting. It's just very hard to get through. So um, it can happen to anybody, but it really is in our interest to find out how do we keep this thing filled up? What are the factors that are draining it away? And then what can we do to fill it back up? That's really what most of the rest of the talk is going to be about. I want to frame this um, in, in kind of newer scientific findings. So the, I, I call this the science of hope because we want to use these ways of understanding to grab this by the handle of hope. And um, I want to talk about these three things, genetic expression, neurogenesis, and neuroplasticity. And I'll explain these as we go. So we'll start with genetic expression. I think it's commonly understood that when we're born or when we're conceived, we have this genetic makeup, our DNA, 
that stays with us pretty much unchanged throughout our lifetime. I say pretty much because as we age, it does start to fray around the edges just a little bit. Um, there's things do tend to come apart slightly. And so there, there's things we can do about that. But by and large, our DNA is, is we're stuck with it. But what hasn't been as well understood, and it's a pretty recent scientific finding, is that the DNA is the blueprint, but whether or not that shows up in our bodies depends on a lot of other factors. And that's what's known as epigenetics. Epigenetics means that basically you might have an illness gene, you might carry a gene for an illness, but it only shows up if it gets activated, if the gene, if a switch gets turned on. And the, the picture you see here is if you imagine that around this double helix, these DNA strands, there's a lot of other genetic material that was thought to be just extra stuff. It was referred to for years and years as junk DNA. But we now know that it's actually where these switches get turned on or turned off. It's like a series of gateways or pathways that, that the, the message goes through in order to get to the cell and get translated into building some kind of protein or enzyme or something. So it's, it's a series of gateways that can be turned on or turned off depending on certain conditions. Now what we want to understand then is are there things we can do once we've had an illness, things we can do to shut it off again, and if we haven't developed an illness, are there things we can do to prevent it? So it's, it's known as epigenetics, and this is what we know. There's, there's a lot of other things that we're learning, and we're going to find out a lot more. But these are some things we know of that activate illness genes and others that turn them off. So on the negative side, it's the stuff we've all been aware of for a long time. Alcohol and tobacco, endocrine disruptors, which are chemicals largely that are found in the food and water that you can't avoid altogether, but where you can, it's a good, it's a good thing to do. And then um, the effects of long-term stress also activates illness genes. On the negative, or excuse me, the positive side, things that help protect us or turn these genes off. Phytonutrients in fruits and vegetables, and the phytonutrients are the things that give them their very bright colors. So eating brightly colored and a lot of different variety of fruits and vegetables. Second thing is exercise, which I'm gonna talk more about later. And then the third thing is cultivating positive emotions. So it's not just about stress and negative emotions, but it's what do we do to purposely create positive emotions to counteract that. And I'm going to say more about that too. So the, what I call the first root of resilience is to balance your brain chemistry as much as possible by what you put into your mouth, by the food that you eat, maybe some nutrients that you take. But but to try to do those kind of things as best we can before we, we go to medications, because you know the, the brain makes the neurotransmitters, the brain chemicals, from the ingredients it gets in your food. That is the only way that that can happen. And I'm not saying that diet can cure everything, don't get me wrong, but it is a really good place to start. And if diet is really poor, it's much harder for medications to work properly and also harder to work long term. How do you eat better? Michael Pollan was given that uh, challenge to say it in just seven words or less. And here's what he came up with. Eat food. Not too much, mostly vegetables or mostly plants. Now there's a lot in the seven words actually. Eat food, what does that mean? Eat food, in his definition, means eating the way that our ancestors ate. Food has not been processed or changed or had nutrients taken out or had other nutrients added in. It's food in its natural state. 
And also our ancestors ate diets that were highly varied. They ate much more variety of foods than we do, which seems weird because we have such abundance, but we, if you think about it, we tend to eat the same few things over and over again. So a wide variety of real food. Not too much, he says. This is perhaps the most significant finding that shows up over and over and over in scientific studies on nutrition. And that is the, the thing that causes our brains the biggest challenge is by eating too many calories that get quickly turned into blood sugar. So blood sugar is the enemy of hel a healthy brain. And it's keeping your blood sugar pretty well regulated as you age is truly one of the most protective things you can do against um, cognitive problems like dementia. So, and then um, thirdly, is mostly plants, mostly vegetables, be again, because of those brightly colored protective elements that are in plants. So the second of these scientific categories is called neurogenesis. And what neurogenesis really means is that our brains are making new brain cells to replace some of the old ones that we've lost. And this happens our entire lives. It does not stop. I remember learning, and I bet many of you learned something similar uh, when we were in school. I remember learning that when you're born, you have a whole lot of brain cells. And when you get to be somewhere between, say, f six and 12, the brain has pretty much come together and it's done as much of that as it's going to. And then after about the age of 12, you know, it's just kind of slowly downhill. Now there is a little truth to that, but it's not as stark as it was meant, or as, as it sounded. And at the time I was in school, no one knew that the brain is capable of repair, of, of replacing old cells with new ones. We knew that the skin can do that. We knew the liver can do that. Bones can do that. Most organs in the body can repair themselves, but we didn't think the brain could. And you couldn't really study that because you had to essentially wait until a person was deceased and then look at their brain on a, um, a you know, cut it up and look at it on a, on a slide. So they finally realized that um, there was a way to study this with people who were terminally ill, so people in a hospice, hospital type setting. And they, they um, and so most of these people were quite elderly, but all of them were very sick, very, very sick. And so they didn't know what this would show. And even then, even in that case, they showed very clearly a robust um, creation of new brain cells right up to the time of death. So we are doing this throughout our lives. We don't replace every one of them that's lost, but we can replace quite a few of them. And this is what we wanna be able to do and do very efficiently and successfully. So I wanna talk about how to do that. There is a brain chemical, it's called BDNF, but just think of it like miracle grow for your brain cells. It's really how it works. It helps to promote new cells, helps to improve memory and learning. It helps the cells survive because it enables them to connect to a lot of other brain cells. That's what really leads to their survival. Oops. And here are the things that improve it, that we know of. Exercise shows up again, and in this case, it does not need to be vigorous. In fact, it showed that very vigorous exercise seems to be less effective than just kind of a steady, you know, um, maybe a gentle aerobic activity like, like walking. Um, now, I do, I do need to be honest here that these studies were done on, most of them on lab animals, so lab rats, and there is a very big difference between lab rats and human beings. If you put one of those running treadmill devices in a rat's cage, they will actually use it. Whereas we all know, we all know the difference there between them and us. So, um, 
An enriched environment also, work done on lab rats basically, shows that um, having an enriched environment is really important for these cells surviving and connecting. And here's what it looks like for lab rats. Not that different from what it looks like for people. It is having something that challenges you, like learning a new maze for a, a rat or learning a new skill or activity that we have not yet mastered. So it's something that, that makes us a little bit frustrated at first. And then it's, it's working through that frustration, learning it, kind of you know, creating some mastery, and then having that satisfaction. That's what's so good for the growth of these new brain cells. Really, really good for brain health. Um, so it's, it's being challenged by something, and it's also having toys to play with, and then having playmates to use those toys with. So being challenged, playing, and having playmates. Third thing, you see diet shows up again, and very similar list. Calorie restriction means just don't eat too much, especially of the sugary foods. Phytonutrients shows up here again, and then omega-3 fats, which you can get in you know, seafood, nuts and seeds, olive oil, those, those good healthy fats. Fourth factor is serotonin, which is kind of a long discussion we won't have right now, but serotonin is an important kind of partner with this miracle grow. And then the fifth thing is social connection, which again is very easy to control. In rats, you put another rat in the cage and they have social connection. Now, um, there was one scientist who had a, the idea of trying to determine which of these factors is most important for creating new brain cells. And so he compared all five of these things and also age because age does make a difference here. As we age, we are not as good at making new brain cells. So he compared all six of those factors. Which of the six do you suppose was the most powerful at helping new brain cells survive? It's social connection. Social connection beats all of the rest, even age, which is quite amazing. It is perhaps one of the most protective things we can do, have genuine you know, relationships with others. Now in this case, again, it's pretty easy to manipulate those variables. It's not so easy for us, I realize that. But, but still, in the study, it was the old rats who got to hang out with other old rats who did better than the youngsters that were running and you know, eating well and all of the rest. So um, managing energy, I refer to this as the second root of resilience. Managing energy means to me keeping your body good at making energy. And that really means that you have to, you have to expend it. You have to continue um, moving, exercising, you know, creating some sort of um, pattern in your life that you, are, you remain physically active because that's what forces your, your body's cells to be good at producing energy. So um, these are the CDC guidelines for weekly exercise. I'm not going to ask you whether you meet this or not, but I will tell you that, um, so two and a half hours a week or 75 if it's more intense. Um, I will tell you that only about 20 to 25% of adults in our country m meet this kind of minimum requirement or suggestion. Now, I also wanna share a story with you that puts this in a little bit of a different perspective for me. About, uh, Oh, 15 years ago maybe, I was doing a talk with an elder hostel group at the University of Minnesota. So these were people in their you know, late 70s and, and 80s mostly. And they were living in the Twin Cities at the time, but, but that's not where they grew up. So we were having a conversation, sort of a back and forth discussion about why is depression get, becoming more common. And I said to people that were my parents' generation, I said, well, one reason I think is because life is harder now than it used to be. You kind of get that that was not a good thing to say, right? 
So, you know, I, I already had gray hair. I was turned gray early. And they said things to me like, Sonny and young man, as they very quickly shared stories from their youth. And even though they lived in the Twin Cities now, nearly all of them grew up on a farm or in a rural community. And most of them had to work really hard when they were growing up. That was kind of their point. So I learned two things from that. One is don't ever tell your elders that they had it easier somehow than you did. <laughs> And then secondly, it's not that long, historically, that we have made our living through our minds rather than our bodies. You know, our near ancestors, just a generation or maybe two generations ago, most of them were involved with agriculture in one way or another, or maybe, you know, industry. But but going back even a little further than you know, the Industrial Revolution, I mean, everybody moved their bodies for not two and a half hours a week, but probably six to 10 hours every day. And remember, that's how we evolved. We evolved to be moving a lot, all of the time. We did not evolve to be so sedentary. So I, I keep this, put this slide in just to, uh, kind of remind us or, or point out how important and how, how powerful exercise is as a treatment even for something like depression. It's not just a preventive thing. It is actively a treatment. And there's scores of studies about this that you never hear of because they're not, they're just not as sexy, I guess, as, as some of the other, you know, interventions, medications and whatnot. But but exercise compares really well, usually it comes out on top. So in this study, they're looking at older adults with treatment resistant depression, meaning they've tried two or three or more medications and they didn't get better. And they had two groups. One group was told to walk for 45 minutes a day, five days a week. The other group was simply not given that instruction. The group that was told to walk, they didn't all do it, but most of them did at least a half hour, you know, three or four days a week. And they improved to, at the rate of 26% improved, whereas zero, not a single person in the other group recovered from their depression. So it's a, it's a very, very useful uh, treatment if you can, can get yourself moving. This is a slide of a physician from the Mayo Clinic, Dr. Levine. He's the fellow that invented this treadmill desk that you may have seen or at least heard about. The treadmill desk is set to move so slowly that you're not even really at a walking pace. You're just moving a little bit, but you're doing it, you know, throughout your workday. So he calls this non-exercise because it's not really, you're not even getting your heart rate up really. But you see the picture how, how slim he is there. He used to be very overweight, apparently. And he, he's an endocrinologist. He knew how to lose weight. He simply couldn't do it, in part because he hated exercise. Um, so non-exercise worked for him. It can work for all of us because it does a lot of good things for your metabolism. It activates your metabolism. It's really good for brain and cogni cognition, so being focused and attentive. Um, obviously very good for weight loss because of that metabolic change. Now, the treadmill desks, I, I think they still cost like eight or $10,000. So you probably don't want to do that, but you don't have to, to apply this kind of principle. You know, it means doing something like standing up every 20 minutes, all throughout the day. You know, if you have a Fitbit or something, it, it wants you to take at least 250 steps every hour. So those kinds of things, it's not that hard to do 250 steps in an hour, it's not that much. So, you know, again, it doesn't have to be exercise the way we have come to think about it, but it does require that we move our bodies. The third root of re resilience is aligning with nature. And what do I mean by that? I wanna talk about what stress looks like in the natural world, okay? And I want you to be thinking about what, how differently we relate to stress in our lives. So this is a, 
the, the title of this slide is actually the name of a book, a very good book called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. He's using the, the, the idea that ulcers are stress related and there's some controversy about that. But, but so many illnesses that we know as modern health problems are stress related, at least in part. So he's saying that in nature, they don't develop these problems because wild animals, animals in the wild, do not suffer from chronic stress. Chronic stress. But people do. <laughs> so this was this picture here, I think it was photoshopped. I don't I'm not buying it, <laughs> but but I, I do want to share with you uh, kind of a picture. I'm going to describe for you an event that um, I have seen you know, this on a video, and you can probably find it yourself too. But this is a video of what happens in the wild when an animal's life is threatened. So imagine something like this. You're, you're, you're looking at an Africa savanna, different animals take out the motorcycle, and it's a herd of gazelles, a herd of African gazelles that are just peacefully grazing you know, on the grasslands. And then to the left of your screen, there is a cheetah that you can see racing toward the herd. And you know, if you've ever seen this kind of thing, it's kind of amazing. It seems like all the gazelles realize this at the same moment. They all crouch and then they start racing away and they run sort of like a, like a school of fish. You know, they're kind of moving all together. And they're really fast. These gazelles are very, very fast. The cheetah's a little bit faster. And so um, you can see the cheetah kind of gaining ground and he's got his eyes set on one of these poor gazelles. And before long, sure enough, he catches it, jumps on its back, pulls it down to the ground. The gazelle's body goes stiff. And as I'm watching this, I think it's just been killed. But it hasn't been killed. There is a third option when fight or flight don't work. The option is called freeze, and it's automatic. The animal's not thinking, oh, I'm, it's time for me to play hide and seek, and maybe he won't notice. It's just an automatic reaction. You freeze. People, some people do this when they're you know, in a real, very traumatic situation. It's no shame in it. It's just an automatic reaction. Sometimes when that happens, it's life-saving because whoever's chasing you gives up. And sure enough, you're watching this, this cheetah, and it gets up and walks away, and you don't see it again. Now, I'm watching the gazelle, and it's still just laying there. I still think it's dead. But then it starts to move. And then it gets up on its knees, and it's really wobbly. And then it gets up on all fours, even more wobbly. And then something really strange happens. The gazelle's body begins to shake shaking just like, like mad. And it goes on for what seems like a very long time. It's probably two or three minutes, but it's just shaking its entire body. Apparently what's happening there, and this is applied to um, some um, treatment programs for trauma with, with uh, humans. That is that if you relive the trauma and you shake your body very vigorously like this, it is, in a sense, kind of resetting. You know, it's, it's like rebooting your computer in a way. And, um, and so you keep watching this gazelle and the shaking stops. And then something even stranger to me happens, which is that the gazelle walks over to the rest of the herd and starts grazing again as if nothing had happened. It is not carrying it's stressed with it, which we do because, as Sapolsky says, we've evolved to be smart enough to make ourselves sick. We think about it. We ruminate. We replay it. We think, what, did I, what could I have done differently? You know this, the story, all of these things. So if you were to measure the stress hormones in this gazelle, you would see within probably milliseconds of the th realizing the threat was there, adrenaline would shoot through the roof. It's just like that. And that's what gives the 
animal or gives us the power to run or to fight. And, um, but that only lasts about maybe 15 to 20 minutes, 30 minutes probably at the most. You can't sustain that for very long. So that's a quick on and then a pretty rapid drop off. But there's a second stress hormone called cortisol. It doesn't start to rise for a few minutes, probably takes four or five minutes before you could measure an elevation. But then it does go up and it stays up in this case, it stays elevated for about 24 hours. If you were to watch the gazelle for the next 24 hours, what would it be doing? It'd be eating and sleeping. It would be restoring its energy. That's what cortisol helps it to do. That's part of its job, to, make, to increase the hunger so that you restore all these calories and to um, initiate the rest cycle. Now, there's a third thing that it's doing that you don't see, but it's really important, I think, if we care about our brain as we're aging. And that is that cortisol stimulates the memory center. It's like pushing on that memory button. It's really, really important. Why? Because you don't ever want that to happen again. You want to remember how you got in this pickle and hopefully what you can do to avoid it so that it doesn't happen again. It's a survival thing. That's really okay in the short term. It's really not okay for your brain in the long term. You know, we just talked about neurogenesis, making new brain cells. This is one of the reasons why we need them, because brain cells cannot be always activated, always turned on. They, they don't do well with that. They're much more likely to die off, particularly in the memory center. So again, as we're aging and we care about cognition and you know, keeping dementia at bay, learning to manage stress, we can't avoid the stress, but learning to to change how we relate to it can be really, really helpful and important. One aspect of that, and I'm, I'm not going to say too much about this because I, I do a whole half-day workshop on sleep. It's super important. But, but I, what I want to leave you with is this notion that if you are not sleeping well, now, and sleeping well it doesn't have to be perfect. You don't have to sleep st straight through the night, but getting roughly seven or eight hours most nights with maybe just one or two, kind of hopefully brief interruptions. If you are not sleeping well and you're not feeling rested in the mornings, keep learning and working on this until it improves. It is such a crucial factor at sustaining um, good mental health. It's probably, you know, it's, it, it is clearly one of the most protective things that we can do, is to keep our sleep more or less intact. Um, if you had depression, major depression, and your sleep was, was off kilter, if you got your sleep on track, your chances of recovering just double. You just improved your chance of recovering by 100%. If you're not depressed and you started having trouble sleeping, you just increased your risk of becoming depressed by 100%. It is that important. And then, um, probably don't need to say this in this audience, but, but I might. I'm going to say it anyway. And that is that in my lifetime, I have seen us as a society, as a culture, largely give up this notion of Sabbath and what it, what it is and what it means. Now that may not be true for, for all of you or for you know, this church, but, but look at our society. It is very clear that people don't take a day to rest and restore themselves, much less do what this author suggests. You know, that consecrate your time with your attention, your mindfulness, listening to what is most deeply nourishing. So I really think whether it's you know, in a formal way like you might do in an you know, active church congregation or something else, we really need to be attentive to having time to pay attention to what gives us most meaning and most a sense of connection. And then the third 
and final aspect of the science of hope is neuroplasticity. Um, probably most of you have heard the term neuroplasticity. Simply put, it means that the brain is able to change itself and create new connections, new neural pathways throughout our lifetimes. This never stops. It never stops. Really, the only question is, what kind of path are we creating? So let me give you a metaphor here, too. I think this is a useful image. Picture yourself standing in front of a grassy meadow. And it's got long, tall grass that no one has walked over before. And then you walk across it one time, just one time only. That is similar to what happens in the brain the very first time that we have a particular um, sequence that, of learning or we've had a particular thought or emotional reaction to something or just been challenged and had some resolution for it. It's, we've, we've created a very, very mild pathway. If you walk across the meadow and you look back, you can see where the grass has been bent down. But if you don't do it again, it's just going to disappear. So, you know, if you do something once but you never do it again, you're not going to create that neural pathway. But then imagine that you walk that same route, the same path, not just once, but every day, maybe multiple times a day, maybe every hour. You know, and supposedly we are having, you know, some 30,000 some thoughts a, a day that most of which are repeating the same darn things over and over again, but we aren't aware of them. We're, we don't realize that we're doing this, but we are. And so if you're doing, if you're creating these kind of thought patterns that do not serve you well, that are some, in some way harmful, and we all do this, it can be super helpful, and it's possible to do this, to be able to recognize that you have done this, you've created this path that you don't want, it is not serving you. And so back to the meadow, if you stopped walking that every day, and maybe you did it for a prolonged stretch, the grass would gradually grow over. Now, it wouldn't disappear totally. If you started walking it again, it would come right back. But, but it's for all practical purposes, it's, it's faded away. And we can do that with the things that we know are harmful to us. And again, we all do this, but people who struggle with these kind of things do it perhaps a lot more. And of course, this is one of the things that hap should happen with good therapy, is learning, learning to step back from this. But it can be really helpful to engage in some practice, like mindfulness, where you can learn to recognize the thoughts that you're having. Because it's usually occurring at a subconscious level we, that we're not aware of. Now, on the flip side of this, imagine that there is something some pathway in your life that you really know would be good for you, it would be helpful, but that you don't have very well established. Something like gratitude, compassion, maybe self-compassion, uh, loving kindness, um, curiosity, awe, anything that is good and healthy for us can be created. It can be turned into a pathway if you simply practice it enough purposely and intentionally because our brains are designed in such a way that we tend to gravitate toward the negative. It's probably a protective, you know, survival thing. We need to see what's wrong. But when we're constantly being drawn to what's wrong in the world, what's wrong in, in ourselves, we're creating these unhealthy pathways. We have to counter it on purpose by creating some of these, um, these higher states of being. This is really what, what we're trying to do in, in the Joy Lab that was mentioned at the, during the introduction. It's about cultivating, uh, we got 12 different, we call them elements of joy, that we are really trying to intentionally cultivate and bring more to life uh, because it is so good for our mental health. 
this is a, a kind of a poetic way of saying this. We are what we think. All that we are arises with our thoughts. With our thoughts, we make the world. I want to share um, a study here that, that doesn't directly have anything to do with mood or, or resilience, but uh, you'll see the connection. But it, it, it tells us just how powerful our mind is at creating our day-to-day -day reality. So the study is looking at neuroplasticity in a part of the brain that deals with movement of the hand. So in this instance, they're looking at the, the left side of the brain that controls right-handed movement. And they're, they're measuring the size of this cortex, this, this movement cortex, through these sophisticated um, devices like a MRI or PET scan. So they measure beforehand and then for two weeks, the participants are told to practice playing the piano, the keyboard, with just one hand and learning the song and playing it over and over and over again. After two weeks, this part of the brain on the left side has grown by about 25%. It is, it is clearly a powerful thing to practice moving like this in terms of the size of the brain that controls it. Now, to me, that's not really so surprising. It's kind of like if you, if you wanted to get your right arm muscles bigger than your left, you take a dumbbell, you go like this, you know, 25 times a day for two weeks, you're going to have bigger muscles here. But then they did something really interesting. The next group was given the same exact instructions with one big difference. They told them not to actually move their hand. Just imagine it. So now they're just picturing hand movement, but they're not moving their fingers. And the part of the brain that controls movement grew by the same 25%. Now, I know some of you are thinking, that means I don't actually have to exercise. <laughs> I know you're thinking that. I, I thought that. It just really means that our minds are indeed very powerful. And what we're playing in the, through them again and again is creating something. It's at the very least, it's creating these neural connections that we refer to as neural pathways. <clears throat> now, the fifth root of resilience is to learn to face emotions with some degree of skill and equanimity. This, I love this line from Rilke. He says, let everything happen to you, beauty and terror. Just keep going. No feeling is final. If you've ever been in an episode like you know, panic attack or bad depression or something, you, you know what I'm talking about here. You believe that the feeling is the final word. It's never going to change. And so there's this, this thing called emotional reactivity that some people may have naturally more than others, but it's also something that we tend to create where we, something happens and we have a too strong emotional reaction to it. And once that gets going, it's, it, it kind of becomes a pattern. It's sort of a new habit, if you will. And it's a very high risk thing to have if you want to prevent something like depression. So learning to, to um, recognize how we are doing harm to ourselves by our thinking and this emotional reactivity, again, gives us a, a way out of it. I want to share uh, another image with you. You see the the picture here of a warrior batting away arrows, you know, back in the day when that was how people fought. So the concept here, it refers to the first and second arrow. So imagine that the soldier is out in the battlefield, just like we are every day. If we're out there living our lives, the slings and arrows are coming our way. There's no avoiding that. You can try to you know, bat them away and you know, dance away from them as best you can, but the longer you're out there, you're, the, the more likely you are to get struck by one of these. You are going to be wounded, you're going to be hurt. But that's the first arrow which we can't really do too much about. 
There's pain, there's hurt, none of us are exempt. But then imagine that in response to that, being struck by the first arrow, the soldier takes another arrow out of his own quiver and stabs himself with it. That's referred to as the second arrow. It sounds ludicrous, and yet it's something that most of us do constantly. Because of how we think about what happened, how we think about ourselves because such and such a thing happened. So we pile it on. You know, the, the initial wounding is there, and then we just make it worse because of how we think or react to it. That is known as the second arrow. And I told you about how, why we have to intentionally create more of these positive ways of thinking and feeling because of this negativity bias because our brains are a little bit more geared towards judging, being critical, looking for what's wrong. The sixth root of resilience is what I call cultivating a good heart. I also love this quote by Hafiz. He says, love is the great work. It's kind of true. This is really what life is about. Love is the great work, but he says, Every heart is first an apprentice, meaning we have to learn. Love is something we might feel spontaneously from time to time, but really cultivating a good heart, one that can stay open, that can stay connected, that can really learn to love in a greater sort of way, that takes effort, it takes time, it takes an apprenticeship, if you will. I talked earlier about the two wolves story. I want to share a little bit about this research, looking at, um, at these Buddhist monks. This was something that was very, it was a very big study a few years ago. You probably remember seeing or hearing something about it. it, it the study occurred not far from here at the University of Wisconsin. And um, what they did is they brought in these very experienced Buddhist monks to measure their brain activity in what's called the prefrontal cortex. Now this is, I think this is the brain's version of the two wolves. Because on the left side, right behind your forehead, the left prefrontal cortex, if, if that's more active than the right, you're in that kind of that good wolf state. You're feeling more open. You're feeling more connected, more generous. Um, you're not so self-absorbed. You, you feel warmer with other people. You feel safe. When the other side is more active, it's just the opposite. You're kind of in the bad wolf. You're feeling closed in, um, unsafe. You might feel a little suspicious. You might feel a little bit irritable or angry toward others. You push others away. Now, why would we have both of these things? Because they're both important. There are times we need to be kind of protective and close, you know, kind of close ourselves off and be a little bit suspicious and so forth. But we don't want to live there. We don't want to live in that state. And these monks, because they practiced this thing called compassion meditation for decades, in, in some cases, they are really, really good at activating this left side, kind of opening up the good wolf, if you will. So the research here hooked them up to this you know, very, very fancy, uh, sophisticated measuring device to, to measure the activity in these two areas of the brain. And then the monks were given the instruction to, to view a picture of a little baby that had a deformed skull or some, some deformity on its head and, and just told to try to create a, a heartfelt sense of compassion for this little child. So that's what they did, and in seconds, their left prefrontal cortex was activated, just lit up, like so much so that the researchers were thinking something was wrong with their equipment. Then, after you know, repeating this with several of these Buddhist monks, they took a group of people, probably not so different from us, well-meaning, um, people who maybe believed in this kind of thing, but had never really practiced or been trained to do this. And they gave them the same instruction, look at this picture, try to feel yourself with compassion for this child. Nothing happened. The, the right prefrontal or cortex kind of stayed equal with the left. It didn't change. However, 
with just a very short period of training, just a couple weeks of, of you know, a few minutes a day, learning to open yourself up, learning to hold attention on either your own or someone else's suffering with compassion. And they were able to activate this left-hand side at will rather than just by chance. I mean, I think all of us, if we're confronted with something, we might be able to, you know, to feel compassion or caring about another person. But to be able to do it just because you want to, because you choose to do it, that's a different level of skill. And it's incredibly protective. Feeling that way, feeling open, safe, caring, generous, is such a qualitatively different experience than to feel kind of closed down and a little bit hostile or, or irritable. And then finally, the seventh root of resilience, probably the most protective thing of all, is to create deep connections, meaningful connections, not just with other people, but of course, yes, with other people, but also with a sense of something greater than yourself, something that gives you a sense of meaning, purpose, and also, I would say, with your deeper inner self, your soul, if you will. Having time for those relationships, all of those relationships, if we want them to be meaningful. The Dalai Lama says we can live without religion and meditation, but we cannot survive without human affection. I told you I would share the one thing that you can do, and this is it. This is my last slide. I came across this quote a few years ago, and I don't know much about the, the man who wrote this, but I think he was an academic that, that was active maybe 40 years ago or something. But it's a beautiful quote. And he said, the, there is one thing we can do and the happiest people are those who can do it to the limit of their ability. We can be completely present. We can be all here. We can give all our attention to the opportunity before us. So it's, I think it's a beautiful notion that the quality of presence and attention that we bring just to our everyday lives it doesn't have to be anything special, but to the extent that we can be more present for it really makes a big difference, not only in the quality of the interaction with others, but also um, within ourselves, mostly within ourselves. So I'm just going to... Um, I'm just going to close with a quote that I love. Uh, this is a quote by uh, Rumi, who said, half of every person is wrong and weak and off the beaten path. Half. The other half is dancing and laughing and swimming in the invisible joy. Thank you very much, and we will take questions if you have them. And if you do have a question, raise your hand because we, we, want, we want you to use the mic so that um, people who are streaming it can hear it as well. Thank you. Um, agree with your philosophies and, and your teachings and what you're saying. Um, I have a question as to how um, you can reach younger people to, that are maybe struggling with um, particularly anxiety and depression at younger ages. It's like it's an epidemic right now. And do you have some yes. guidance on that? Yeah, so the, the, yeah, the question is about you know, how, do, how, how can younger people who are clearly struggling, even more probably than adults right now, um, how can they be reached, how can they be helped? Um, I, 
throughout my career, I've, I've always worked with adults, but a large part of my work has been at the college level, and they're still kind of kids. Um, they're in transition. And, and that is the age, you know, that probably 16 to 25 age range is when most kind of ongoing mental health problems begin. So I, have a, I do have a perspective on that, and I think it's a really important question that you're asking. And I can tell you, every college campus in the country right now is struggling to meet the needs, to respond to the level of crises. It is, it is really um, concerning. I totally agree with you. So the question, how can we reach them? Um, one of the reasons I like working with that population is that at that age, it doesn't take very much change in order for the outcome to be very, very different years down the road. If, if, if you imagine, you know, like a, a railroad track running parallel and then you change the, one of the tracks just one degree, 10 miles, 100 miles down the road, they're going to be very, very far apart. And that's kind of what I think, how I think of that age group. So as an example, um, learning to manage their sleep schedule, because at that age it's not usually that they can't sleep, it's that they, they get out of whack. Um, learning to manage their sleep schedule can protect kids that age to a very large degree from even severe things like bipolar and major depression. But in terms of how to reach them, I am by no means expert at this, but I do think that there, there is some potential to do some good things with social media and um, very, very short um, and lively uh, ways of communicating, you know, because people have changed and, and younger people are not as likely to read a book or listen to a lecture like we just, <laughs> you guys just did. So, you know, I, it, I think it, it, it means really being creative and getting, um, programs and education out there in a medium that they can really relate to and, and that they are likely to go to. I actually just did a, um, a panel discussion about this or just last week, I guess, and uh, because it is such a big concern. And there were some very good ideas about how to help parents limit their kids' exposure to social media because, you know, that is a big driver. It's a very, very big driver for this. And, um, and also how to use some kind of innovative uh, strategies like there's some video games that help kids learn to be more mentally healthy and resilient. You know? So there's, there's tools out there that if people could access, I think might really make a big difference. But starting at the very least with um, parents of younger kids really, really being clear about limiting how much exposure they have to social media and really just to electronic devices in the first place. They change your brain when, you, when we interact with them constantly. Yeah, so a question over, over here. Yeah, thank you, that was actually really helpful. So whoever asked that question, that was helpful. Um, we have a teenager, she's 14, who has struggled a great deal with anxiety and depression and trying every med on the planet. And they just cause their own issues, which just make things you know, worse. And you mentioned doing a, um, setting up something through Courage Kenny, this resilience training. So then, and I was just curious, are there programs like that out there for young people? And um, I mean, like we've got her in outpatient day treatment right now with the school component. I mean, is this, it just seems like we're missing a couple, I mean, she's learning to journal and develop some of that neuroplasticity stuff, but the nutrition, the exercise, that kind of thing just seems to be really lacking. And um, do you know, I mean, you mentioned having um, started something with Courage Kenny is there, are there things out there? Yes, there are, there are things out there. Um, there is a program that I, I, I know the, the founder, 
quite well, and she's very good, and the programs that they offer are very good. I think the, I'm not sure I have this right, uh, the name of it, but I think it's called Move Mindfully. And so it's, it's largely about mindful movement, and it is geared towards kids and schools and you know, getting people to be in their, their bodies more and more present and attentive, but, um, but that is a, a really helpful strategy. There's another, another group that's, I think, over in uh, Wisconsin that, that's called Me Moves, M-E-M-O-V-E-S, which is maybe towards younger kids, but again, trying to really encourage this this mindful, attentive movement. Um, there's a program that, of all people, Goldie Hawn, you remember the actress Goldie Hawn, has really done a lot of great work sponsoring um, programs for kids in schools. And I, I'm not thinking of the name of it right now, but if you just you know, searched for her name and then you know, teenagers or, or resilience for kids, you'd find, you'd find it. And it's really quite good. There, there are things out there, there are growing up, you know, options for kids. You know, and I, I think it's a little harder to find people who do a good job of incorporating the nutrition piece. That is, I, I'm not aware of a really good resource for that. But, um, but if you want, I can give you a name of somebody afterwards if, if you're looking for maybe an individual to help. Right. Right, for teens, right, I'm not, I'm not aware of one, but. Any other last questions? Right here, hang on just a second. Hi, I just uh, heard a podcast yesterday uh, with a Dr. Alan Gordon about neuroplastic pain and how our, I work in chronic pain management and how our body becomes so accustomed to being in pain that regardless of structural change or improvement, we continue to have pain. Um, are you familiar with any of that work? Um, he's got a really good book called The Way Out that is on my way to Amazon to my house right now. Mm -hmm. So the question is about, am I aware of programs looking at chronic pain? And particularly this, this man, Alex Gordon? Alan, Alan Gordon, The Way Out of Pain, is that, or The Way Out, I guess it's called. And he's talking about uh, ways to manage or, or why we stay in pain even after we've healed physically. Yeah, yeah, why do we stay in pain even after we've healed physically? And, you know, you could say the same thing about emotional pain, probably. Why do we, and, you know, I, I don't know much about specific programs geared toward that, but I really do believe that, um, that that's a that's a really good analogy to kind of what what I was talking about with our brains and the emotional pain because we we create patterns and when they've been the when it's been the way things are for long enough then it's very hard to change it back and here's what I believe about this and I, I'd be curious if the if the same thing was true for pain but here's what I believe about changing the brain, I sh didn't say this earlier, but I think that to really create a new normal, a new homeostasis, it takes about six to 12 months. And I think I, I, I say that for lots of reasons. I've seen how, how long it takes for people to really recover after stopping some kind of substance use. You know, they'll feel better at first, but to really create some long-term change, six to 12 months. I think, you know, if any of you have been on antidepressant medications, you've probably experienced something like this. You get better at first, and then about six to 12 months later, you're not feeling so good anymore. And again, it's, it's because that's created a new normal. Coming off medications, it's around that same amount of time before you're, you really have a chance to find out where you're going to be. So what I like to tell people who are working with these kind of programs is, um, you probably do need to feel better quickly in order to stick with it. But to really, really create the enduring change you want, do not stop for a minimum of six months and probably a full year, whatever it is that you found helpful, because that's how long it takes to create that 
that new way things are. Mm -hmm. Getting the exercise. You are. <laughs> wow. You're in this meadow, and you're changing the path. You don't want to keep going down this negative one. You want to direct it to a new one, the positive one, you know? How do you do that? How do you do that? How do you do it? Yep, yep. So I'm going um, to try to talk kind of briefly about this. It's, it's, not, an easy, it's not an easy thing to do, but, but I'll try to give you a sense for how one does that. So. Um, Let's say, let's say we're, you want to cultivate compassion. Okay, you want to you want to have be able to have more compassion, maybe for yourself. Okay, let's look because you know people who struggle with these things usually they're very very hard on themselves, and so let's say that instead of being hard on yourself, you want to create a gentler, kinder way of viewing yourself. The first thing you have to try to become reasonably good at is to be able to see what it is that you're doing, to see things as they are, which means you've got to practice a little bit of being able to observe your own thoughts so that you can recognize when, okay, I'm, I'm having that negative thought about myself again. I'm beating myself up again. You don't have to become like a Buddhist monk, you don't have to become really good at meditating. You just need to be able to step back from your thinking experience enough so that you can see it, okay? So get, first you gotta see what is. Second thing, which is also really difficult, is to you, you also need to accept that things are the way they are. Now, I want, I want to say more about that because it, it's not quite what it sounds like. You don't need to resign yourself and say, I'm not going to change anything. I can't, you know, that feeling like you have to just give in. It's not that at all. It just means that you have a lot more strength and ability to change things if you really, really start from where you're at which means accepting, okay, this is simply where I am right now. This is how things are in my life. This is what I've been doing to myself without beating yourself up about it, but just kind of acknowledging that this is, this is how things are. And then the third thing is to act wisely. And that means um, take some kind of, you can't leave it at the level of thought and acceptance. You do need to make changes. You need to take some form of action. I say wisely because there's all kinds of actions we could take that just make things worse. So, you know, you, you need to have a little bit of ability to kind of sort them out and say this, this looks like a healthy action to me. And, you know, it, it, with that particular example about trying to become kinder toward yourself, there's very specific guided meditations that you can do to start kind of creating that within yourself, from the inside out. If you do it even a few times, chances are you will start to notice that you're feeling a little bit differently toward yourself. Now this is such an involved process that, you know, right now I'm in the middle of creating a like a whole year's program, you know, the called the, the, it's the Joy Lab. So, you know, if you're interested in doing this, it's very affordable, it's very accessible, but it it allows you to practice these kinds of things. There's a new a new element each month, and we walk you through it. Every week there's a different exercise you, you can practice, a different recorded. It's called joylab.coach. If you go to joylab.com, you're going to find a nice line of Target clothing, <laughs> very brightly colored Target clothing. So <laughs> I think we're at our time here. So I just want to thank everybody very much for being here and being so attentive. It's been a pleasure to be with you.
Oh, shoot, the website again, it's called joylab.coach. Joylab.coach. Coach. Well, Dr. Ammons, thank you so much. I know I learned a lot today, and I'm excited to take some of this stuff home with me. Um, once again, thanks for coming out. What a wonderful day, and what a privilege to have you here. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you.